with science and technology throughout the month of the August, which is organized as a part of the celebration of the second foundation day of our institute. We had a month long experience to listen and interact the pioneers in the field of biotechnology and bioinformatics. We had insightful scientific discussion, we updated our knowledge, have learned so many new things. I hope you have enjoyed the previous lectures and eagerly waiting for the last talk of the series. Before we start today's session, I would like to convey my sincere gratitude to the organization, organizing committee. Without mentioning the names, special thanks to those who are in the backstage and uh, did commendable job to successfully conducting this annual Distinguished Lecture Series 2021. On behalf of organizing committee, I also convey my sincere gratitude to all the speakers and the attendees. Now I'm taking this opportunity to request you to browse our brochure and website to know more about our institute, JIS, IASR, and the courses we are running. We have MSc in Medical Biotechnology and Bioinformatics, Advanced Diploma in Bioinformatics and PhD programs. All contact information is given there in our website and our, in our brochure and also visible on screen. Email us or call us for further information. This is my proud privilege to grace all of your presence today in the last lecture of the series, which will be delivered by Professor Stephen Backert. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation and being with us today. Live streaming of this talk is available on our YouTube channel, Test J I S I A S R. Please write your questions to the chat section of Zoom or comment section of YouTube. May I now request Dr. Shuja Chattopadha to introduce Professor Beckert. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Shuja Chattopadha. Uh, this is a complete delight uh, for me to introduce you all uh, with our today's distinguished speaker, Professor Stephen Beckert. If I start giving you the complete list of his awards, publications, and professional engagements, I will be able to steal the entire time of today's lecture. He is such a big name in the field of microbial pathogenesis, working in the field for more than a quarter century. So I will keep it short. Uh, after his uh, PhD in genetics from Humboldt University, Berlin in 1996, he was a postdoc for a year or so at the Department of Botany and Microbiology in the Auburn University, USA, being funded by the German Science Foundation, DFG. Uh, then in 1997, he moved to the Max Planck Institute for Infection Biology in Berlin, Germany, as a group leader and principal investigator. In 2003, he joined the Department of Medical Microbiology, uh, Otto von Zurich University, Magdeburg, Germany. In 2008, he became the full professor of cellular microbiology at the School of Biomolecular and Biomedical Sciences, University College Dublin in Ireland. Then, uh, since 2013 till now, he has been the full professor at the Department of Biology Institute for Microbiology in Frederick Alexander University, Erlangen. Nuremberg, Germany. Currently, he is also the chair of microbiology and the chair of the Erlangen Center of Infection Research, ECI. He is, uh, he is professor at the Department of Medical Otto von Wierig University, Magdeburg, Germany, and the co-founder of the Dublin Academy of Pathogenomics and Infection Biology, DAPI. He has many patents, Robert Koch Pulitzer Prize, PI Award by the Science Foundation Ireland and so on. His uh, major research is the investigation of molecular signaling pathways during host pathogen interactions in enteric infections, such as that of Helicobacter pylori, Campylobacter geni. His laboratory focuses on the identification of new bacterial virulence factors, either secreted or injected, which could represent potential novel targets 
for therapeutic intervention. Without any more delay, let's welcome Professor Stephen Backert. Today, the title of his talk is Helicobacter pylori genetics and signal transduction in gastric carcinogenesis. Dear Stephen, thank you so, so much for accepting our invitation, despite the fact that for you, this is the major vacation time of the year. Thanks a lot again. Over to you, Stephen. You're welcome. So, okay. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. First of all, I wish to thank uh, the organizers for the kind invitation. It's a, a big pleasure and big honor for me to speak in this distinguished lecture series. Uh, as outlined uh, in the introduction, my group is working for more than 25 years in the field of Helicobacter pylori, and we are mainly interested in characterizing bacteria vector molecules and their signal transduction involved in gastric carcinogenesis. Uh, so to give a brief introduction, Helicobacter pylori is a human specific gram negative flagellated bacterium, as you can see here. It was first isolated uh, from gastric biases in 1983 by these gentlemen here. Uh, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, and they identified uh, H. pylori as a pathogen in a spectacular self-experiment. And for their discovery and research, they received the Nobel Prize for Medicine uh, in 2005. The transmission of, of the bacterium occurs primarily um, from person to person uh, via an oral, oral transmission route and occurs mainly in early childhood and mainly within families. So about 50% uh, of the, and therefore H. pylori infection is one of the most common bacterial diseases in humans. And almost all infected uh, persons develop a superficial or chronic gastritis, as you can see here. And this can progress further into peptic ulcer disease or gastric cancer, as you can see here. The common treatment regime is the so-called uh, triple therapy uh, containing two antibiotics and a proton pump inhibitor. And as with many other uh, antibiotics treatments, a major problem here is also that uh, the, the, the spread of antibiotic resistances, which also occurs in Helicobacter. Uh, I also should mention that without eradication, H. pylori can survive for lifetime in its host. A vaccine is not yet available, and H. pylori is therefore a model system for persistent bacterial infections. The oldest known H. pylori stems from a copper aged mummy found frozen in a glacier in the Italian Alps in, in Europe uh, in the year 1991. The, the, and this mummy was named Ötzi after the place where it was found near the Ötztal here in the Alps. Um, actually here at this place uh, labeled with a red dot at about 3,200 meters above sea level. Um, and it was then uh, uh, investigated by medical doctors and researchers in the laboratory. They found that the mummy was a 45 year, years old man and uh, Ötzi died 5,300 years ago by numerous injuries and the narrow head found in his shoulder blade. 
And so Etsy became one of the oldest criminal cases in human history. However, scientists have taken out the GI tract of Etsy and isolated the total DNA from different positions shown here and sequenced it. And surprisingly, they found Helicobacter pylori sequences across the entire genome shown here blue and in blue and yellow and um, uh, showing the, the H. pylori genome with certain marker genes labeled here. The top view here shows the number of reads uh, per site. And the sequencing results showed that Ötzi's uh, H. pylori was a hybrid uh, between the early African, uh, shown here in light green, and today's Asian population, shown in gray, uh, where that obviously existed uh, in Europe a few thousand years ago before the today's European isolates were introduced later. Today, we know that H. pylori colonizes about uh, 3.8 million uh, humans and is associated with numerous gastric diseases shown here. Actually, you can see a Venn diagram uh, of the entire world population that I have taken from a paper from Barry Marshall. And you can see here the uh, in orange, the Helicobacter negative people and in red, the Helicobacter positive population. And the black circles here indicate the subpopulation with gastric disease. And you can recognize that the majority of these diseases is uh, associated with the red H. pylori infection. And so about 10 to 15% can develop a duodenal or a gastric ulcer. And one to 2% here can develop uh, malignant diseases such as gastric cancer or stomach lymphoma. The gastric adenocarcinoma is actually the fourth abundant death causing carcinoma worldwide with about 900,000 new diseases and deaths every year. And uh, these adenocarcinoma have a poor prognosis. The median five-year survival rate is about 25%. Uh, however, as we can also see here in this Venn diagram, the majority of infected people here, 80 to 85%, do not show symptoms. And the latter phenomenon can be explained by the fact that the outcome of H. pylori infection and the development of gastric diseases are multifactorial processes. And in fact, the outcome depends on four major factors shown here, the bacterial genotype, the genetic predisposition of the host, the diet and environmental risk factors, as well as the interaction with the microbiota. While the interaction with the microbiota is just at the beginning to emerge, diet and environmental factors uh, uh, include, for example, alcohol consumption, salty food intake, lack of vitamin C in the food and smoking. However, the best characterized factors are the genetic factors of the host and the bacterium. The H. pylori genomes are relatively small in size with about 1.6 megabase pairs and, and encode a series of uh, so-called virions or disease-associated factor that are highlighted here. In green are shown uh, the outer membrane proteins allowing binding to host cells, including the famous adhesins BABE, SABE, HOP, Q, OEPA. In blue are several violence factors, including toxins VACI and GGT. And today in my talk, I will mainly talk about the serine protease called HTRA shown encoded here and the effector protein KGA. KGA is actually part of a so-called pathogenicity island called the CAGPI. This is shown here. Uh, and this CAGPI is present in highly virulent isolates and absent in less virulent H. pylori. And this is a locus of about 40 KB carrying up to 32 genes. And they are flung by direct repeats shown here. And this passage is the island was acquired by a horizontal DNA transfer event from a yet unknown ancestor. Genetic studies of the 16S ribosomal RNA and other sequences from worldwide strains demonstrated 
that we currently have five major populations on uh, uh, our planet, shown here in the genetic tree and here on the map, shown with these uh, different colored circles. Uh, the most ancient H. pylori sequences are found in Africa. We have actually two Afrin populations, Africa 1 and Africa 2, shown here, composed of CAC by positive in the north and CAC by negative strains in the, in the south. Then we have a big population in Europe, is, which is a mix of CAC by positive and negative strains. And we have two major uh, subpopulations in Asia, Asia 1, blue here in Japan and Korea, and in red, Asia 2, a mix of CAC by positive and negative strains in uh, China and uh, um, other surrounding countries. And this genetic tree, what we see here, also shows that the last common ancestor is um, a member of the Epsilon Proteobacteria family, which are actually VACE and CAC by negative, uh, such as Campylobacter jejuni and Helicobacter uh, hepaticus, which diverged about more than 200,000 years ago. In addition, there uh, was a host jump here, indicated here, about 100,000 years ago, when Helicobacter pylori um, uh, was transferred from uh, to big cats like lions, cheetahs, and tigers. And, this and at this time, uh, obviously, a helicobacter positive human ancestor was probably eaten by a lion in Africa and developed into a new species called, now called Helicobacter arsinonychus. Together, these genetic studies here uh, show that H. pylori are actually accompanied Homo sapiens for more than 100,000 years and was spread worldwide by the migration, human migrations that are shown here on the map by the red arrows. Yeah. Uh, and at about the same time when the migration out of Africa happened about 60,000 years ago, uh, it was shown that the Kakuai was introduced at this position here. Yeah. And so we currently have a, a, a mix of CAC by positive and CAC by negative strains here uh, around the globe. According to the model uh, developed by um, uh, Korea, there are different uh, uh, developmental stages for the intestinal type of adenocarcinoma shown here. And these stages develop gradually in a long-term process over years and decades. And we start with a healthy human uh, mucosa shown on the left, which is infected by H. pylori. And uh, H. pylori therefore interferes very early in this disease process. And H. pylori first induces a superficial gastritis, which can progress into a atrophic gastritis, intestinal major plasia can occur later, dysplasia until adenocarcinoma uh, can develop. And genetic studies showed the present, that the presence of the CAG pi is essential for uh, uh, gastric cancer development. Also essential uh, are increased or elevated interlogging one beta uh, concentrations uh, um, induced by Helicobacter pylori. And as you know, interlogging one beta is an important regulator of inflammation and gastric acid secretion. And this is mainly controlled by the genetic predisposition of the host uh, because in the interlocking one beta genes, there are a couple of SNPs, so single nucleotide polymorphisms, especially in the promoter region, that control elevated interlocking one beta expression in a subset of patients that show a high risk for adenocarcinoma development. Yeah. And this development is also accompanied by mutations in the genomes accumulated over time. For example, in the tumor suppressor P53, in RAS, GTPAs, and loss of DCC. In fact, the postulates of Robert Koch were fulfilled for Helicobacter pylori in an animal model. And this animal, animal model of choice are the Mongolian gerbils. The Japanese group by, but by Watanabe and colleagues showed that H. pylori actually induces adenocarcinoma after one year infection. 
And later on, it was shown by the by a US group that a highly carcinogenic strain called 713 can even induce adenocarcinoma shown here in 16 uh, weeks. In addition, another Japanese group by Hatakayama produced transgenic mice expressing KGA in the stomach. And for this purpose, they cloned the KGA genes under the control of a gastric promoter and introduced them into mouse embryos. And after one year of growth, the mice died by um, due to development of gastric cancer, as you can see here. And the conclusion here from these experiments is that KGA is actually the was described as the first bacterial oncoprotein, which even works without H. pylori infection and induces um, gastric adenocarcinoma. Functional studies in my and other labs have shown that the CAG position is the island shown here on the bottom again, and codes the so-called type 4 secretion system, short T4SS, uh, for the injection of CAGA. And this type 4 secretion system is similar to the prototypic system known from Archobacterium and Tumefatians, which you know induces crown gall tumors in plants. And this type 4 secretion system includes 11 VRB and D4 proteins shown here, and all, they are also called KEG A to KEG Z uh, proteins, plus KEG alpha, beta, gamma, and delta uh, proteins. And these proteins, they assemble in the inner and outer membrane of the gram negative bacterium to form such a pillows like a transporter machine. Uh, in gray, we have the uh, extracellular pillows components. In green, the, the so-called inner core components, and the inner core components are connected to three NTPases in the cytoplasm shown here, which provide the energy for the translocation process. And last but not least, we have here a chaperone called KGF in yellow, providing a substrate specificity by binding to KGA. The type 4 secretion system core complex has been biochemically purified and visualized by electron microscopy by the group of Tim Kober and forming such a nice wheel like structure um, uh, with an outer ring of 41 nanometer and an inner ring of 19 nanometer uh, plus 14 spokes and an inner central uh, uh, channel seen, you can see here. This slide here shows a reconstruction of the type 4 secretion system particles shown before at a resolution of 5.4 uh, angstrom. Uh, and please note that the, there is a high similarity between the in vivo and in vitro um, structures shown here by uh, electron microscopy. And uh, uh, on the bottom, you see that this core structure is composed of three parts shown here in the model, uh, the outer membrane core complex, OMCC, in blue, the periplasmic ring complex, PRC in green, and the stalk region in gray. Please also note that there's a channel here in the middle for effector molecule delivery. As next, the group of Tim Kover and Melody Owe established the 3.8 angstrom cryo EM structure of the core complex. And in blue, you can see here uh, the top view, side view, and bottom view. And on the bottom, you can see the secondary structural model uh, containing the, uh, um, uh, the uh, central ring in blue the outer ring in red, and um, the uh, connecting 14 spokes in green, forming a, a 35 angstrom channel here in the middle. Uh, here you can see uh, a high resolution movie showing the cryo -EM density of the type 4 secretion system and the molecular map of the um, PRC subcomplex. This is the top view with the channel here in the middle and the bottom view you can see here. The resolution 
of the cap structure was then high enough for mapping of individual comp components of this core structure. Three proteins uh, of the CAG pi were identified, CAG X in green, CAG Y in blue, and CAG T in red. And on the right, you can see the cryo M density model as a, a ribbon diagram. And interestingly, CAG Y here in blue forms the ridge of the cap like structure at the core complex and is composed of uh, beta helices. And these beta helices are predicted to breach the outer membrane to form a channel here in, in the middle for substrate delivery. On the bottom, you can see actually a comparison of the type of secretion system core complex from Helicobacter, E. coli, and Xanthomonas uh, C3. And the, uh, the structural homologs are highlighted with uh, red, blue, and green color. And you can see that the CAG type of secretion system is significantly larger than the others uh, with about 410 uh, total size of 410 angstrom compared to 170 for E. coli and 225 for xanthomonas. And these differences among others could have an important functional implication, for example, on the mechanism of effector molecule translocation, which is currently under uh, um, uh, uh, investigation. While the core structure discussed in my previous slides is preformed in the bacterium, the extracellular pili actually come out only upon host cell contact. And this is shown here in scanning EM pictures. And these pili are labeled with the uh, yellow arrows. And these appendages are about uh, 200 to 300 nanometer long and about 20 nanometer in diameter. And they come into direct contact with the host cell uh, membrane, as you can see here in this example. And finally, the KGA protein here is then delivered uh, from the bacterial uh, cytoplasm directly to the, through the pillows into the uh, host cell cytoplasm. Interestingly, KGA translocation into the host cell is not a random process. It requires a host cell receptor that is shown here in violet. And studies over recent years in my group and others have shown that integrin beta-1 and also CCAM receptors, CCAM you probably know are carcinoembryogenic antigen related cell adhesion molecules play a role in, for the delivery of KGA. Yeah. Interestingly, we could further demonstrate that CAGA is recruited to the pillow tips. This is shown here by um, uh, immunogold labeling with specific antibodies. And in this case, uh, the immunogold is uh, contrasted with, with white. And this is an exciting finding because this offers the possibility that CAGA is surface exposed at the pillow tips and can bind to receptor and is then taken up from the host cell. The three-dimensional structure of the 100 kilodalton N-terminal part of KA was then uh, crystallized. Um, and remarkably, uh, there is no structural or sequence similarities to any known protein reported so far. And this N-terminus of KA contains three large domains, uh, one, two, and three. And while domain one in blue represents a mobile uh, N terminus of KGA, domain two in, in yellow is responsible for KGA tethering to the plasma membrane, and domain three in red is um, interacts intermolecularly with the C terminus that are shown here. The C terminus itself was not, um, uh, the structure was not solved and was modeled here. And the C terminus contains interestingly three phosphorylation sites. Um, labeled with orange that are called APR motifs A, B, and C. In addition, we have two blue sequences. Uh, these are KGA multimerization sequences where KGA can multimerize, and they are called CM motifs, shown, shown here. Interestingly, the H. pylori genome itself does not encode any tyrosine kinases, and therefore, uh, host cell kinases must phosphorylate KGA 
upon infection. And indeed, after infection, we found that KGA is phosphorylated by cellular ZARC and apyl kinase at, at these three appear motifs, A, B, C, that you see here at the sequence level. First, we, we could show that appear motif C can be phosphorylated by the ZARC kinase, while the Abelson kinase is later activated and activates all three phosphorylation sites. We then have postulated that KG8 mimics a host cell protein upon injection and three KG8 phosphorylation sites, again shown here, may represent recognition motives for eukaryotic signaling factors after translocation. Um, actually, in eukaryotic cells, such PY motives can interact with so-called SH2 domains or P2B domains that are present in normal signaling factors. And to test this hypothesis, we synthesized phosphor and non-phosphor peptides from each of the APO site, and we bought them to a column, added lysates from host cell, washed them, and subjected them to mass spectroscopy. And remarkably, this analysis revealed multiple binding partners for each PY site. So uh, uh, as shown here, um, we found, for example, uh, kinases such as CSK or PI3 kinase. We found phosphatases such as SHIP1 or SHIP2. We found uh, adapter proteins such as GRAB2 or GRAB7. And even a ras molecule was found to bind to these phosphoepia sites. And interestingly, all these factors shown here uh, encode at least one SH2 domain. Yeah, but no PDB domain. And this means that KGA has specialized during evolution to recruit SH2 domain containing factors that you see here, which then trigger signal transduction events to manipulate the host cell. And these excitings were extremely surprising because phosphotyrosine based signal transduction in mammals strictly follows the key and lock uh, principle shown here. So one phosphotyrosine in eukaryotes interacts only with one specific SH2 domain. And this actually ensures a high specificity in signal transduction in mammals. However, this is definitely not the case for injected KGA. KGA is tyrosine phosphorylated and obviously functions like a pig lock or a master key to open many doors for, of the host. And this means that it interacts with myriads of host cell factors. And this obviously ensures H. pylori taking control over the host cell and the cause of infection associated uh, with the development of certain diseases. Altogether, we know now more than 24 interaction partners of intracellular KGA, 10 uh, phosphotyrosine dependent, which were uh, uh, um, identified uh, in my lab, including the ones that I've shown before. And they are also phosphorylation independent uh, interaction partners identified by other labs, including, for example, Integrin Beta 1, the receptor I mentioned before, Ekaterin, uh, PAR1, uh, TAC1, and so on. In summary, uh, we and others have shown that injected KA. Um, induces multiple signaling transduction events with important roles in human cancerogenesis that I have summarized here uh, in, uh, um, uh, in an overview. And in particular, five major cancer-related phenotypes are affected by intracellular KGA, chronic inflammation, cell proliferation, cell motility, inhibition of cell polarity, and anti-apoptosis. Having established the function of KGA over the last years, we next asked the following three questions. First, can we monitor uh, type 4 secretion pillars formation during infection of polarized epithelial cells? The second, are there non keg pi factors involved in the delivery of KGA? And the third, where is KGA translocated into polarized ep epithelium, apical, basal, basolateral, or anywhere? First, we have um, closely inspected uh, the apically bound bacteria 
for pillus formation by scanning electron microscopy. And the results show that the majority of apical bound bacteria shown here, and here's the quantification, have no pili at all, and only a few have just one visible uh, pilus when bound apical, so on top of the cells. We have then removed the cell layer, the cell monolayer from the substratum and investigated the basal uh, Helicobacter pylori shown here. And strikingly, more than 70% of the transmigrated basal vertebral bacteria exhibited these pili, as you can see here with the red arrows. Uh, and up to six pili per bacterium were detected. And these experiments strongly support the view that the type 4 system is inactive when the bacteria adhere at, at apical surfaces. Uh, however, the, the type 4 secretion may be activated after traveling through the epithelial cell monolayer and re, uh, reaching intergreen rich basal arterial compartments. Second question, are there non keg pi factors involved in KGE delivery? And this is the time point when the aforementioned serin protease HDRA comes into play. And we have recently described HDRA as another secreted violence factor of Helicobacter pylori. In general, HDRA proteins belong to a conserved family of heat shock proteins uh, that are present in bacteria, yeast, plants, and humans. And these HRI proteases usually contain a trypsin-like protease domain and one or two PTZ domains as shown here in orange. And these PTZ domains are involved in, in substrate binding and um, oligomerization into large complexes and uh, cellular localization. And in many bacteria, these HRI proteins are localized to the periplasm where they form these uh, proteolytic active oligomers. And it's well known that HGRA is critical for stress tolerance and survival of the bacteria uh, because under stress conditions, HGRA can act as a chaperone with important functions in the degradation and refolding of misfolded or mislocalized proteins. And therefore, HGRA has crucial functions in intracellular protein quality control. Surprisingly, we could then show that HRA can also be secreted in the supernatant. For example, uh, you can see here one experiment. We use specific antibodies against uh, HRA that we generated labeled with immunogold, here contrasted in black. Um, and you can see that, that HRA molecules are, are detected inside the H. pylori, but also outside uh, uh, the bacteria, shown with the red uh, uh, arrows. And on the, on the left, you can see that HRA is secreted here as a, as a cellular protein. And on the right, you can see that they are present in so-called uh, outer membrane vesicles here that um, uh, are continuously shattered by gram-negative bacteria. So we could see here that uh, HRA um, not, not only has intracellular functions, but also important extracellular functions. Uh, to study further the in vivo relevance of secreted HRA, we then examined antrum biopsies of patients by electron microscopy. Here you can see the controls, Helicobacter pylori negative patients. You can see here um, in the stomach a proper epithelial cell lining of four uninfected epithelial cells called AC1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, these cells were stained with the HRA antibody as control, and you can see here no signals are, are from HRA as seen here. So the antibody is highly specific for HRA and does not recognize any host uh, uh, structures. Uh, in addition, these controls show that um, uh, microvilli can be detected here uh, in the healthy cells at the apical size facing the gastric lumen. Uh, and typical cell to cell junctions, you can see this in higher magnification, in particular tight junctions in blue, uh, arterial junctions in orange, and also desmosomes here labeled with green arrowheads. We then investigated 
Helicobacter positive, positive antrum uh, biopsies from 20 patients with dyspeptic symptoms. And here, the situation changed dramatically. The proper epithelial cell lining suddenly disappeared after infection. Many of the infected cells deformed or even came come out of the epithelial cell monolayer shown here. An H. pylori colonized the gastric epithelial cells at the apical sites, and you see them here labeled with the red arrowheads, near the intracellular tight junctions shown here with the, with the blue arrowheads. Uh, uh, and you see here that the tight junctions actually dislocated from the uh, ones that I've shown before in the healthy tissue. And in addition, the bacteria deeply penetrated at intercellular clefts shown here, and the protease HRA is massively uh, secreted that you can see here and in the magnification um, here. And similar to the situation in vitro shown before, the stainings in patients in vivo show both HDL present within the bacteria, labeled with the violet arrowheads here, and secreted HDL with the yellow arrowheads, detected in the extracellular environment. In order to investigate the molecular events of the HDL-associated phenotype, we continued with in vitro studies. And for this purpose, we used three polarized epithelial cell lines called EGS Ekaterin, uh, MKN28, and MVCK cells. And these cell lines were cultivated here on a transfer filter system. And they were grown here in these inlays in, in monolayers and were differentiated to a polarized phenotypes for two weeks. And the tightness of these monolayers were measured with electrodes. Um, we actually measured here the, the so-called trans resistant tear. In addition, we tested the cells for typical apical and basal marker. This is shown here. By electron microscopy, we could show the presence of apical uh, uh, microvilli here, also in our in vitro system, uh, as labeled with the blue arrowheads. By immunofluorescence microscopy, we can show that the marker protein azrin here in red is at apical sites. By immunofluorescence, we can further show that the basal marker, integrin beta 1, is shown at basal sites here in red. And last but not least, the adherence junctions, uh, marker protein ecaterin, seals uh, the cell to cell junction, is labeled here with red. Taken together, we created here an in vitro uh, system. Uh, with properly sealed and polarized cell monolayers. And so these cells were then infected at, from the apical side with Helicobacter pylori and then studied. Here's the top view using scanning electron microscopy. The cells were infected uh, with H. pylori at a multiplicity of infection of 25. And after four hours, you see a few bacteria are already bound. And after eight hours, almost uh, all bacteria were bound to the cell surface. And interestingly, more than 90% of the bacteria attached near the cell to cell junctions, with, which were visualized with these uh, yellow dashed lines shown here, which was actually a nice confirmation of our observations with the Helicobacter patients in vivo, where Helicobacter also colonized near the cell to cell junctions. And after 12 hours of infection, we found that the cell junctions near the attached bacteria, as you can see here, uh, are opened in a local fashion. Uh, you can see here again two neighboring epithelial cells, EC1, EC2. This is an apical view. You see here a bunch of Helicobacter pylori cells uh, that actually start to move down here in, the, in these clefts, as shown by the uh, white arrows. And this can even be better seen here by transmission electron microscopy on the right, where you can see a side view of two neighboring epithelial cells, EC1, EC2. Here are the tight junctions here. And you see three uh, bacteria in a row uh, on transmigrating from the apical to the basal lateral compartment. And these findings by electron microscopy suggest that Helicobacter pylori can effectively open 
both the tight and also the adherent junctions and enter the cell molar layers during infection. And this, what you see here is actually a, a classical paracellular pathway of bacterial transmigration to disrupt the epithelial barrier and reach basolateral compartments. And this phenotype was associated with the HGA-dependent cleavage of host cell proteins. In particular, we observed the fragmentation of two tight junction proteins, occludine and claudinate. You see this here in the Western blots, where you see the fragmentation of the infection in lane two. And both proteins were confirmed as HGA targets by in vitro cleavage using the recombinant proteins, where we can see the same size cleavage products for uh, claudinate and occludine shown here. Mapping studies showed then that the cleavage shown here by the skissers uh, uh, actually occurs in the second extracellular loop of, of occluding and the first extracellular loop of claudinate. And this leads to inactivation of the proteins and opening of the tight junctions. We subsequently also demonstrated that HGA cleaves Ekaterin in the Ateran junctions. The domain structure of Ekaterin is shown here. Uh, Ekaterin is a 130 kilodalton protein and it contains a 100 kilodalton uh, amino terminal fragment called the NDF domain. And this is followed by a short transmembrane domain in blue and a 35 kilodalton intracellular domain in violet. And using Edmund degradation and mass spectrometry, we identified seven cleavage sites shown here with the skissers in the extracellular domain. And sequence analysis revealed that HAA uh, cleavage actually um, occurs favorably between hydrophobic amino acids, in particular between valine, isoleucine, threonine, and alanine residues. And we could even determine a consensus cleavage site uh, pattern for HGRA in Ekaterin. <coughs> Sorry. To further corroborate the, our findings, we applied immunofluorescence microscopy, here shown against Ekaterin in, in green and Helicobacter in red. The mock control is shown on top and shows the proper cell-to-cell uh, -cell junctions between all neighboring cells in green and no red signal. And after infection on the bottom, uh, 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 samples, individual cells show down-regulated or dislocated Ekaterian signals that are marked with the blue or yellow arrowheads respectively. Similar results were actually obtained for occluding and claudinate, and these data collectively indicate that the action of HRA is associated with enhanced damage of the set of cell junctions over time. Together, our data suggest that HGRA, besides KK that we heard earlier, has an important, have an important role in pathogenesis. And we therefore started in cooperation with Giesbert Schneider and Celia Wessler to search for HGRA inhibitors. And to make a long story short, we screened hundreds of inhibitors and found a handful of promising candidates, one of which is HHI, Helicobacter HGRA inhibitor. On the left, you can see here the three-dimensional modeling of HGRA with the active center uh, of the protease domain and the two PDZ domains here. And this is enlargement of the active center with the inhibitor HHI shown here in blue. And you can see here that this HHI inhibitor was fitting exactly in the active center of the protease and was then applied for further studies. On the bottom, you see the immunofluorescence of Ekaterin in red with DAPI as control in blue. And you can see that infection with HP disrupted the typical Ekaterin pattern as seen before. However, in the presence of HHI, uh, the Ekaterin pattern was restored. And this suggests that inhibition of HRA can prevent Ekaterin junction disruption during infection. In addition, we tested Ekaterin cleavage by Western blotting, as you can see here. H. pylori induces the cleavage or the release of the NTF domain shown here 
in the supernatant. And this was profoundly blocked when the HHI inhibitor uh, was uh, present. Uh, surprisingly, the uh, inhibition of HA also blocked the phosphorylation and translocation phosphorylation of KGA as shown here. And this suggested to us that the proteolytic activity of HRA is not only required for opening the tight and adherent junctions, but also for type 4 secretion of KGA. And these findings led us to suggest that Helicobacter pylori transmigration across the epithelial monolayer may be important and an important prerequisite for proper type 4 secretion functions. And we therefore analyzed KG injection in infected polarized uh, uh, gastric epithelial cells using an antibody uh, recognizing phosphorylated KG shown in green, which was counterstained with an antibody in red uh, for uh, better one in the green. And remarkably, uh, confocal laser scanning microscopy of the infected cell re uh, revealed the pronounced phosphor KG signal. Uh, co localizing with integrin uh, here at basal lateral side as indicative for KG translocation. And this is in agreement with the results I have shown before that the type 4 secretion system is inactive uh, with no PILI when um, uh, colonizing the apical size and is only active when reaching basolateral compartments leading to injection phosphate of KGA, which you can see here. As control, we detected no green signal in the mock control and also no uh, green signal when the HHI inhibitor was present, as you can see here. Taken together, these data indicate that KGA is injected uh, across basolateral expressed integrins here after HDI made mediated opening of the cell to cell junctions and after transmigration of the bacteria to these basal lateral sites. I would like to sum up uh, these results with a model. During infection, H. pylori colonizes the apical surface of the gastric epithelium. Here, uh, you can see two epithelial cells in gray. And here the bacteria have no PLE seen, so the type 4 secretion system is inactive. KG is not injected at basal at, at, at apical sites. Instead, the bacteria secrete the serine protease HRA into the supernatant. And HRA can then cleave the junctional proteins, uh, occluding claudinate and tight junctions, and ecaterin and adherent junctions, as I've shown. And these cleavage events open the cell to cell junctions locally and subsequently the bacteria can transmigrate between neighboring cells from top to the bottom reaching basal lateral uh, compartments and inject KGA uh, when they make contact with its receptor and KGA is then delivered into the host cell where it can uh, activate intracellular signal transduction that uh, eventually leads to gastric cancer development. Here are some take home messages in, in a written form. So I, I hope uh, that I could convince you from uh, a couple of things that I've shown you. H. pylori is actually a chronic infection that can persist lifelong in the half of the human world population. A subpopulation of the infected people may develop specific gastric diseases such as uh, chronic gastritis, ulceration, gastric carcinogenesis, and the CAG pathogenesis in the islands, encoded type 4 secretion system, affected protein KG and HRE, represent major disease associated factors. And this type 4 secretion system forms a specific core structure that was characterized in detail by other groups, uh, as I have shown you, which we understand now uh, uh, pretty much in detail. And this core structure is connected to a pillow structure that we have investigated and which is induced upon host cell contact. And the type 4 secretion pili are primarily induced at basal lateral size and not at apical surfaces. And H. pylori infection in vivo and in vitro is associated with epithelial barrier disruption. 
and we identified the serum protease HRA as a novel secreted violence factor and recommend or secreted HRA can cleave occluding claudinate and ecaterin. And this cleavage opens the tight and arterial junctions in the gastric epithelium after infection, which enables H. pylori to travel down between neighboring cells by a classical paracellular pathway. An inhibition of HDRA and uh, confocal laser scanning microscopy support the view of a basolateral TF4 secretion system activation and delivery model for KGA. An intracellular KGA can then interact with more than 24 host cell proteins that they have interest to you here. And in this way, KGA mimics a host cell protein to hijack intracellular signaling. However, uh, the exact delivery mechanism of KA and other substrates through the type of secretion system channel and pilus and across the host cell membrane is not fully understood yet and requires further information. And with this, I would like to end up. Um, uh, here are members of my, of my this and previous groups, uh, people that were involved in the work. Uh, I, I should also mention I had a former PhD student from India, Sunish, uh, uh, who continued then as a postdoc and uh, is now back in India, who did part of the work. And I also have an Indian collaborator, Suai uh, Chatu Patriai, who is involved in part of this work. And here are the funding sources over the recent years. And with this, I uh, would like to end up and would be happy to answer questions. Thank you so, so much, uh, Stefan, for such an uh, insightful, such an exciting talk. And I'm, I'm so intrigued by the model and how each gallery uh, gets access to the vesonical surfaces of four cells. It's, it's uh, yeah, so, <laughs> oh, well, yes, it's, it's bacteria. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, uh, so the, um, the attendees, yeah, I would request you, uh, probably we forgot to tell uh, in the beginning, I mean, if you can write your questions in the chat section here. And also, if you, uh, whoever uh, is watching this uh, talk live, uh, they can write uh, the questions in the comment section of YouTube that will directly uh -huh. jump in here. So we can uh, access all the questions from the chat section of this Zoom. So I would request, uh, so they probably are writing questions right now. In the meantime, I have um, a couple of questions to you, Stephen. So you showed that uh, the, the, you, you, when you are showing the secondary structure um, of this CAG A, and uh, you're, you're, you're telling us that the N-terminal region, there is no known uh, similar you found with the uh, uh, protein sequences that are currently there in the database. So as a whole for the TAC PAI, do we have any information about uh, the possible evolutionary origin of that pathogenicity island? Or we have no clue where it did come from to h -Bandary. No, although we have uh, uh, a similarity to uh the acrobacterial prototypic type of secretion system, uh, the helicobacter one is very specific, contains uh, lots of accessory proteins that are, some of which I have mentioned before. And so this is a unique system and um, which is not present in this way in any other bacterium. So the origin of it is, is, is completely uh, unclear yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it, it's, it doesn't have a single origin, maybe the multiple recombination event or something happened, so it's kind of obscured uh, the origin. Maybe, I, I don't know, I'm just guessing this is as possible. Uh, another thing is, uh, as we know, I mean, uh, most of the bacteria cannot survive in certain acidic environment of uh, the stomach, especially in the antron region. Uh, well, no yeah. So, and you're saying that uh, the 
interactions of this H. pylori with other microbiota uh, is now emerging out. The studies are now uh, revealing uh, some facts. So um, any, uh, I mean, do you have any anything to say? I mean, how actually uh, there are reactions uh, and interactions uh, among uh, these kind of other bacterial species or other microbial species that you think might uh, change uh, or might help H. pylori to do his job in the stomach. If you have any anything to say regarding this, yeah. So uh, first of all, um, uh, studies by other groups have shown that H. pylori um, affects. Uh, the parietal cells uh, and um, affects the acid secretion in the human stomach. So it, it uh, Helicobacter tries to downregulate uh, a gastric acid secretion to make it uh, more comfortable for, for itself. And the, one consequence of this is that uh, the, the gastric pH, which you know is normally between one and, and two, uh, goes up, and over time, um, the, 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 the gastric pH becomes more and more neutralized. And this uh, has uh, other effects that competitors for Helicobacter can also colonize the, the stomach over time. And so there is a, um, a, a group of uh, uh, microbiota reports uh, in the stomach uh, available. Uh, that then compete with the helicobacter. In addition, so this is one thing, the, 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 the stomach uh, changes in its environment over time and um, uh, uh, other bacterial species can then uh, um, uh, overgrow helicobacter uh, at a certain stage and certain time. In addition, it was shown that uh, the uh, helicobacter presence in the stomach also affects the microbiota in other organs. So it seems that, um, for example, it seems that uh, microbiota in, uh, in the colon uh, is also uh, determined or affected by the presence of certain helicobacter strains. So uh, which then can lead to other consequences uh, uh, for certain diseases in, in, in the colon. And, and so um, uh, it seems that Helicobacter uh, is not only present in a small environment in the stomach, and it, it, instead it also talks to, to other bacteria in the human body. But this is... Um, Although we, uh, the new sequencing, um, deep sequencing the procedures are uh, uh, Hello? Can you hear me, Stephen? Am I audible? Uh, maybe there's some problem with the internet connection. Give now uh, information on what bacteria uh, are affected. Hello, uh, Stephen. Can you hear me now? Am I audible? I mean, probably. Uh, uh, Dr. Chotubadhar, I guess he uh, he got disconnected and uh, we can wait a few minutes to. Yeah. So, it's yeah, not here. 
I, I, yeah, at some point I stopped hearing him. I was thinking that it's, it's a problem from my end. No, uh, his screen got frozen and he is not here. He's got this. So let's wait uh, for a few minutes before he can join us. So uh, in the meantime, is it giant? He's probably giant, right? Yeah, he is here. Oh, he's here? He's, yeah, he's joining. Uh, I admitted him and he's joining. Okay. Yeah, he's here. Yep. So now you can talk, I guess. Uh, uh, Stephen, yeah, maybe he's yeah, you. Audio. Yeah, let's. Yeah. Can... Would you would you would you please uh, make him co-host? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's done. Yes, and sorry, I was I I had a problem with the internet and I was kicked out of the of the of the session. Um, but now it, it seems that I'm online again. Yeah. So... What was the next question? Yeah, so actually I was, I um, mean, as you told me, uh, or told us that uh, basically pH binary kind of increases the pH, I uh, mean, uh, making the situation more, I mean, less acidic and more comfortable for themselves. But in a sense that uh, actually uh, through this uh, pathway, he, I mean, uh, they are inviting uh, many other bacterial species, right? So. Are they, do we think them all as competitors that they're also uh, having maybe some kind of symbiotic relationships? I mean, otherwise, wouldn't there be a selection against this uh, tendency of increasing the pH and allowing a lot of other competitors in the same system? I mean, uh, is there anything known? I mean, any work? down in this regard, I mean, uh, should we, my question is, should we call them, I mean, they're all competitors, do we know as them, I mean, competitors, or they might be having some uh, symbiotic relationships with H. pylori helping them in one way or the other that we might not know about. Uh, my, my, my thought is, I mean, if it's all competitors, why there wouldn't be a selection against such process in each pylori uh, while, I mean, helping them to managing the pH in a range that will be kind of uh, establishing a comfort zone for them, but not allowing much of other bacteria as competitors. That is my question. Uh, this interaction with the microbiota, as I mentioned before, is still not fully understood. I, I think many of them are competitors simply because uh, I can tell this from, for example, from iron. The, the stomach lumen is, an, is, is a widely iron deficient area. So Helicobacter, for example, uh, 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 acquires the they are iron from the horse cells. Yeah? And so when they, when there are competitors around, uh, there's even more competition for iron and also for other nutrients. And uh, um, I, I think uh, that's why uh, Helicobacter has also uh, uh, um, other mechanisms to get rid of competitors. Uh, for example, it is this discussed in the literature that the strong inflammatory response uh, induced by Helicobacter is only to get rid of competitors, uh, which are then colonizing to do the lower, to the to the more neutral pH. 
And in the same time, Helicobacter has nice mechanisms that were reported by other groups to, uh, 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 to be protected from the immune system. They have an antifagocytosis mechanism. They manipulate T cells. They manipulate other uh, uh, immune cells uh, not to be uh, uh, detected and, and killed. And so uh, there is a hypothesis uh, which I like very much is that Helicobacter induces this inflammatory response, uh, which is then also important for this as beginning for the cancerogenic process, uh, then removes the competitors you know, at a certain stage. So these processes are ongoing um, and uh, uh, these interactions, however, with other bacteria, uh, are still going to emerge, I think, in, fu in future in future uh, studies uh, uh, by other groups. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I mentioned this to complete the picture. We are not working on the microbiota, <laughs> but I mentioned this because it's a very important field, yeah. and uh, uh, and to highlight the Helicobacter is also talking to other bacteria in the human body, which is going to emerge. Uh, right now and in future. So there are quite a few questions here. First one from uh, Monisha Bose. Yeah. So, uh, can you please explain the evolution of Helicobacter acinobitis from the slide showing the genetic tree? So you're probably showing via yeah, one this uh, uh, tree of uh, different yeah. Mm. So, so Helicobacter, it, it is believed that along with a couple of outgroups. Yeah. yeah. So it is. It is uh, the current. The current. The current opinion is that uh, Helicobacter, the next relative of Helicobacter, is uh, Campylobacter jejuni, and other Helicobacter species such as Helicobacter hepaticus, as shown in the tree which diverged, I think, more than 200,000 years ago. And it's believed that Helicobacter is uh, on human specific. So uh, um, uh, you cannot find this uh, in any other host, although there are some reports of Helicobacter in, in monkeys, but um, uh, I think that, that uh, uh, these are these these are these Helicobacter in, in monkeys in, in wildlife. They stem from humans and not the other way around. So uh, the common opinion is that Helico Helicobacter the only the only host is Hel this, this stomach of the of uh, Homo sapiens, and there's no environmental um, uh, reservoir for Helicobacter uh, uh, known, uh, which is also in agreement with the person-to-person -person spread. And also uh, the, the phylogeny of Helicobacter. When you look at uh, ethnic groups that we have now on our planet, which followed the human migration starting from the out of Africa event about 60,000 years ago. So, and we have now uh, on the planet uh, five major populations um, uh, uh, that, that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, in, Af in America, what I did not say, we of course have uh, the uh, Asian variant of the Helicobacter due to the migration, human migrations across the Bering Strait um, uh, a few uh, thousand years ago. And we have a mix because of the, uh, um, uh, the Europeans that conquered uh, America uh, 500 years ago. So we have then in, in, in America, for example, we have a mix of uh, European strains and also of, of uh, original Asian strains. And uh, similar events is you can see in uh, Australia, for example. Yeah. So uh, uh, we have now uh, the, these helicobacters diverge uh, because of their uh, association with the human horse. And uh, um, yeah, so uh, and are human specific. Mm -hmm. 
So these uh, Amerindian population, they come, I mean, uh, inside the clade of the European one, or it's the Amerindian one from Peru and associated regions? Yeah, the Amerindian one, I think they, they have a clear uh, pattern uh, to be uh, the, the origin from Asian populations, okay. so which migrated uh, a couple of thousand years ago over the Bering Street. Uh, and, uh, and then later on, the European helicobacters were added by the uh, con concretizadors you know, that uh, came later on. And so we have now a mix of those in, in the uh, northern uh, South American populations. The next question is from uh, Kamakshi Sureka. Thank you so much for presenting such wonderful pieces of work. Does a phosphomimic mutant of DAG A uh, represent a more active version in disease formation? How healthy human deal with DAG A induced adverse effects? Uh, does yeah. HTRA facilitate entry of other pathogens too? There are different questions. Yeah. I'm not sure if I understand this question correctly. Um, yes. First one but, is, yeah, saying, uh, but but uh, it uh, it is known from other bacteria they also have effector proteins. They are not evolutionarily related to GAG, but they have the same strategy uh, and become phosphorylated upon injection. For example, in pathogenic E. coli, they have a protein um, uh, called TIR that is also injected uh, into the host cell and is phosphorylated and recruits also host cell proteins for uh, signal transcription. The same has been in um, uh, uh, chlamydia. They have a protein called TARP, uh, uh, which is injected and also tyrosine phosphorylated. And there are a couple of other examples uh, in, 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 in the bacterial world uh, that KGA uh, is not the only factor uh, which is phosphorylated upon injection and then uh, start signaling by recruiting to PY uh, phosphotyrosine SH2 domain interactions, but also other molecules. Um, but uh, uh, many of them recruit other factors which KGA does not recruit and trigger other signaling events. So this is not exactly the same but the strategy is, is indeed used also by other factors, if, if this was the question. Yeah, and also how healthy human deals uh, with gag induced adverse effects? Can you repeat this? I, I, I don't understand the question. So, uh, so well, we understand that gag uh, induces different adverse effects. So how actually uh, a healthy human can deal with such adverse effects in its, his, his or her stomach? Um, yeah. Um, uh, we know, for example, that, that uh, the host cell, of course, tries to counteract these activities, for example, by dephosphorylating KGA. But actually, the phosphatase of KA is not known. Yeah? There, are also there are obviously phosphatases around that can interact with KA. Uh, probably ship one and ship two are such candidates that I mentioned briefly that uh, uh, may be activated by the host cell to counteract these events. Yeah? But this is speculation uh, at, at this stage and needs further investigation in, in future. And also she has this question too, uh, how this serine protease HTRA can facilitate the entry of, I mean, if, I mean, does it facilitate entry of other pathogens too? This, right, this right. So, so, so actually we came up with this new model uh, now uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the first paper was in 2010 in Amber Report um, with the group of Sia Vesla. And uh, afterwards, afterwards, lots of other pathogens, it was the same strategy was reported in other pathogens. Uh, 
um, many other pathogens, and they also reported the substrates. Uh, many of them uh, also cleave in Kajeran, uh, as reported by, by us. Um, uh, 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 my group itself, for example, um, you briefly mentioned this in the introduction, we are also dealing with the with the intestinal pathogen Campylobacter jejuni. Jejuni has also has an HRA, which is secreted uh, into the supernated and actually is, is um, uh, cleaving, uh, as far as we can say now, uh, also uh, occluding and uh, uh, ecaterin and claudinate um, and probably other bacteria do the same way. Uh, and for example, with Campylobacter, I can tell you, they also opened the tight and arterial junctions uh, because their um, uh, invasion receptor is also a basal arterial receptor. Integrin beta-1 and fibronectin are receptors for the uptake of, of Campylobacter uh, to invade the cells. Yeah? So Helicobacter, uh, uh, so, so Campylobacter is also using HRA for his own strategy uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the colon, um, um, secreting HRA, cleaving the, the junction so that the bacteria can transmigrate. And then Helicobacter, it, Helicobacter is a known non-invasive pathogen. It can open the junctions, but it uses then uh, HRA uh, to get access to receptors for injection of Ka and stays outside the, the, the hostel. Yeah? So there's a completely different uh, strategy between these two pathogens as example. Yeah? But there are also other bacteria emerging that HRA can be secreted, um, but um, it's not that well investigated yet as we have done for, for Helicobacter reported today and also for, for Campylobacter. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh... Titi Sharkosh, thanks you for sharing this interesting recent work with us. Sundi Pal asks, uh, first of all, uh, uh, he says it's an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Question is whether KK activity depends on pH and whether there is any role of stomach microbiota in H. pylori activity. Yeah. So there are papers. There are papers that looked at different pH in vitro yeah, um, for injection of PAA. But, but I must say um, that uh, um, you know the, the epithelial cells in the human stomach. They are protected by a mucus layer, and actually the, the, the pH near the epithelial cell surface is not one or two anymore. It's 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 more mutual, yeah. So um, uh, uh, it's it's five or six or something uh, near the epithelial cell surface, and not one or two as in the lumen. So there are uh, the positions where Helicobacter uh, uh, colonizes uh, are not that drastic as compared to the to to, to the lumen. So when uh, um, so the, the, the KA uh, uh, pH dependent injection um, should be looked at with uh, a couple of in a couple of respects, but uh, I think it's not uh, 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 has not a, such an important function probably for 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 the type of secretion mechanism itself. You know? So. Uh, we have done some, some unpublished uh, data on this, uh, and we have actually seen not much difference at these PA ranges concerning the injection of PA. And also, I mean, you might have partially answered this question. So whether there is any role of stomach microbiota in H. pylori activity? Um, there are papers. Uh, we, we are not working on this. There are some papers that some microbiota strains, uh, uh, Lactobacillus, for example, Fusobacteria, that uh, when you culture them together with, with Helicobacter, 
it has some effects on the inflammatory response and and also Kage uh, injection. Um, supporting the view that these bacteria interact and talk to each other and may influence the helicobacter violence properties. Uh, but um, uh, these studies, these are only a few studies and uh, to, to have a complete picture on such interactions, I think we need much more information uh, to uh, uh, make um, a clear statements on this. Another question is from uh, Nipanahu Agarwal uh, uh, asking, can we say HP is involved in gut brain access? Uh, can you repeat this uh, in what? Gut brain access. The gut brain access. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware of any paper uh, that um, uh, uh, H. pylori has an impact on the gut brain axis, but Helicobacter has an impact uh, on, on the uh, gut lung axis. Um, uh, this is also work not by us, it's work done uh, by others, for example, the group of Anne Müller in, in Zurich. They are working, um, they found. What they found is um, they have an animal model for asthma because there are papers in the literature that um, helicobacter presence has, has a negative impact on asthma. And there seems to be a connection from the stomach to the lung. And it seems that this connection is due to um, helicobacter talking to the T cell because uh, it seems that Helicobacter induces a tolerogenic um, immune cell response, such as for the T cells or macrophages, so that they tolerate Helicobacter and not el cannot eliminate Helicobacter. And this has also impact on, for example, on the lung for, for asthma and can suppress asthma. So uh, they have a nice mouse model where they've shown this, that uh, in a T cell dependent manner, um, asthma is suppressed by the presence of helicobacter. But the factors are not KGA being involved, it's, it's rather VAGA and GTT, these molecules that I have briefly, very briefly mentioned at the beginning, they seem to have an effect on, on, on this. Um, so that there is indeed also a correlation of helicobacter, for example, to the, to, to, to the lung. You know? This is, this is uh, 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 well documented, uh, but uh, for the gut brain access, I'm not aware of anything. Uh, yeah, sure. he's adding actually one more question. Are there more proteins that help in HP pathogenesis or aid CAGI? You already have talked about HTRA, I mean, the serine proteins. Maybe he's asking of some other proteins uh, no. Other proteases? Yeah. Other proteases? Yeah, other proteases or yeah. any other kind of proteins? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think uh, I'm aware of, of, of papers uh, showing that there are at least five different proteases that you can detect by protease activity assays. But uh, uh, besides HRA, there's not much known about the, the, the function, activity, and role of the others. They are present. Um, there are also annotated genes of, of different kinds of other proteases. And on activity chairs, you can see at least five prominent uh, uh, proteases besides HRA, but their function, uh, I, I, I am not aware yet from, from any of such papers. Uh, yeah, so since there are no more questions at this point, and then, so thank you. Thank you again, Stephanie, for- You're welcome. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. It was yeah. my pleasure speaking and seeing yeah. you again. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, we'll uh, meet you.
with you. But yeah, we hope to have you again in in future. In in I mean, there'll be more such uh, uh, kind of lecture series uh, uh, coming uh, from our part. I mean, from our institute. And yeah, uh, we you 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 will be bugged by us again. Yeah, sometime. Yeah, in future in in future years to come. Yeah, after. Probably after Corona, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So at the moment, travel is really a nightmare. Yeah. So I hope that we can we can circumvent this uh, uh, Corona pandemic soon, and that we can travel again and, and meet in person in near future. Yeah, that would be excellent. Yeah, I would. I would forward to yeah that time. Yeah. Thank you again, Stefan. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Thanks also again. Yeah. So yeah. it was my pleasure and best luck for everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah. yeah. So this all also ends our uh, session. I mean, we, we had our concluding session with uh, Professor Stephen Baker, the final talk of our six lecture series throughout this month of August. So we uh, thank you so much for being with us, all the attendees here for this uh, um, I mean, uh, series of six lectures uh, to make this effort from us successful. And uh, we definitely will hope to have you with us toward, uh, I mean, our journey forward. I mean, we're just a newborn institute, two year old, and we, we really aim to achieve many more things. And uh, yeah, hope to, uh, I mean, you should hope to have uh, more emails to come from our side for uh, more uh, workshops, seminars, symposiums, uh, lectures series, and so on. And uh, we, we hope to have you uh, with uh, us uh, for, for our journey. So we can have a kind of uh, a new effort all together. And thank you, thank you again all and with this i conclude this session and end this meeting <laughs>